Well, one thing I like about the book of Acts, which we're reading through in these weeks between Easter and Pentecost, is it's such a rich mixture of both dramatic events, but also very homely and domestic scenes. You probably know the book of Acts follows on from the Gospels, and it tells of the first days of the early church. And there's this real sense of the Holy Spirit at work, transforming people's lives as they hear the good news of the gospel for the first time. And often there's real drama, as in the conversion of St. Paul on the road to Damascus, as we heard last Sunday. But there are also these lovely snapshots of family life, of ordinary lives, of ordinary people, people who just happened to encounter the disciples as they took the gospel out into the world. One of those domestic scenes comes in our reading for this morning, and it's the story of a woman called Tabitha, or Dorcas, as she's sometimes known. And we find that she lived in a place called Joppa on the Mediterranean Sea, about 30 or so miles (coughs) northwest of Jerusalem. Luke describes her as a disciple, interestingly, and tells us she was always doing good and helping the poor. And that involved making robes and clothes for widows and orphans and maybe others who were in need as well. And at a time when there was very little provision of any kind for such people, I'm sure Tabitha's care would have been hugely valuable. But then, in the opening words of this story, we find that she is sick and has died. Her body has been washed and placed in an upstairs room. And then those widows, maybe the orphans too that she'd cared for, had gathered around, full of grief at what had happened. And it looks as if that's the end of the story. But then the other disciples in Joppa hear that Peter, one of Jesus' first disciples, was in a place called Lydda, just a few miles away. And so they encourage him to come. And when he arrives, he sees this scene of great sadness and loss. Clearly, Tabitha was someone who had been dearly loved and valued, and those who she cared for would be bereft without her. And so Peter does what any of us might have done in those circumstances. He gets down on his knees and he prays. Maybe he recalled an occasion when he'd been with Jesus when a 12-year-old girl, the daughter of Jairus, had died. And Jesus had taken this dead girl by the hand and said to her, little girl, get up. And extraordinarily, she did so. So I think Peter took his courage in his hands and says to Tabitha, Tabitha, get up. And Luke tells us that she opened her eyes and sat up. And then Peter takes her by the hand and presents her to the, to the believers, to the widows, alive. It's an extraordinary event, but taking place within a very ordinary, domestic, homely scene. And I think what it implies is that this, this ordinary woman who was always doing good and helping the poor, as Luke describes her, was of particular value in the kingdom of God. She might well have been overlooked in human terms, but not within God's scheme of values. Well, I think that Tabitha or Dorcas's story raises the question, certainly for me, of what it means to live a good life. What does it mean to be always doing good in the way that we live? To what extent is that a characteristic of the Christian life? Well, since the time of Aristotle, philosophers and theologians too have debated that question. Ethicists uh, today ask the same questions. What does it mean to live a good life? And perhaps a, more, a slightly more nuanced question we might ask is, what kind of life does the Lord require of us? What might a Christian ethic of behaviour and values look like in our world today? Well, many people in our fairly secular world, Western world, might say, well, it's about doing what seems right for you, going with our instincts in any given situation, going with our hearts, if you like. In many ways, Western culture has moved away from very hard and fast rules of right and wrong. Yes, of course, we keep our laws, our legal system, as a guard against things that are totally unacceptable, unacceptable 
But on a day-to-day basis, their basis, people often speak in terms of what's right for me in any given situation. Our thinking is much greyer than in previous generations. And in many ways, I think it's a lot more complex. People also make judgments by calculating the consequences of their actions. Does what I'm doing hurt or harm anyone else? But in the heat of any given moment, it's not always easy to make those instant calculations or to see where they might lead in the long term. Well, a book I found very helpful on the the subject recently is this one. It's called Virtue Reborn by Tom Wright. I've got a spare copy if you wanted to look at it. Well, he's a New Testament scholar and a previous Bishop of Durham, you may know. And he's done a lot of work on this question. What does it mean to live a good life? And he's understanding that it's not, not simply about doing the right thing in a given circumstance, but it's much more about the development of Christian character, growing into the likeness of Christ. And he says we get there by forming habits or rhythms of life, rhythms of grace, if you like, that mean we live and act in a godly way. Well, he gives this rather nice example of a pilot called Chelsea Sullenberger, who safely landed a US Airbus in the Hudson River back in 2009. You might remember the story. So what happened was two minutes after takeoff, the aircraft ran into a flock of Canada geese, and almost immediately both engines were severely damaged and lost their power. And so he and his co-pilot had to make many major decisions in an instant. And they realised, very quickly realised, the only option was to land the plane in the river. And so, in a very short space of time, they gathered together all their skills, all their experience, and they managed to do the job successfully. They landed the plane and everyone got out alive. And I think Tom Wright's point in that story is that those ingrained habits, uh, those, that experience over so, many, so much time, enabled Sullenberger to do exactly the right thing when it really mattered. So the question for us today, I think, is how do we develop that kind of Christian character that we, means we do the right things? We live lives that reflect the beauty and goodness of Jesus himself. How do we, like Tabitha, live a good life? And I think very importantly, how do we teach those rhythms of life, those values to our children, particularly to our teenagers, as they navigate their way through the world today? Well, I think the Christian life begins and continues and ends with the grace of God. There's nothing we can do to earn God's love for us. There's nothing we can do to justify ourselves. Yet once we have received the Lord's grace and mercy towards us, then he calls us to allow his Holy Spirit to be at work in us, moment by moment, day by day, growing within us the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control, the hallmarks, if you like, of Christian character. And our work is to develop rhythms of life, rhythms of grace that allow us to keep in step with God's spirit within us. So what might those rhythms of life be? Well, one, of course, is prayer, a rhythm of prayer that keeps us in a place where the Lord can speak to us, guide us, comfort us, and strengthen us. Prayer is the lifeblood of the Christian life. Without it, we grow weak and weary, hard and cold. And we need to find a daily rhythm of prayer that will sustain us for the long haul. Prayer on our own, prayer with others. Prayer is something we can't afford to neglect. Well, alongside prayer, another rhythm, I think, of the Christian life is reading the scriptures day by day and in a systematic way. I was talking to someone who's been doing that for the first time recently and found it extraordinary. I think it's when we read the Bible in a disciplined way that it comes to life for us. 
we get to know the whole of it, not just bits of it. And we get to know, we get a sense of who God truly is, his heart of love for the world he has created and his plans for our lives. If you've never read the Bible cover to cover, I'd encourage you to do so. It might seem a big ask, but if you read just 10 chapters a day, you'll get through it in a year. It's something I've done on a number of occasions throughout my life, and it's always been a hugely life-giving, enriching, life-changing experience. So prayer, reading the Bible, what else? Well, I think a third rhythm of grace is worship, coming as we're doing today, coming into God's presence, offering him ourselves just as we are, listening out for his voice, his spirit, allowing ourselves to be changed, to be transformed, offering him the best that we have. Sometimes I think we wonder, why does the Lord ask us to worship him? It seems an odd thing in some ways, and it can seem strange if we've not been brought up to do so. But I think worship is important because it's the place where our Christian characters develop, where we help one another to grow into the likeness of Christ. And it's important for our children too, for our grandchildren in the most formative stages of their growth and development. Well, I'm sure we could mention many other rhythms of the Christian life too, living generously, both in terms of our time and our finances, caring for the poor and vulnerable, often in very practical, self-sacrificial ways, challenging injustice where we see it, locally and throughout the world, caring for the environment, our environment in any way we can, sharing the gospel of hope in a very needy and complex world. They're rhythms that over time build character and they enable us to do what's right uh, in the world today, just as they did in the life of Tabitha all those years ago. Ultimately, they're rhythms that fit us for heaven to live with the Lord there. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.